Football Show. This is your host, Miller, speaking. Welcome to another week in the crazy world of Serbian football. Uh, thank you all for listening to us on Spotify at the Serbian Football Show, as well as on our YouTube channel, Serbian Football. Um, this week, of course, as every week, uh, we have a lot of things to talk about, and uh, this is kind of a, a, a wrap-up episode uh, to end an amazing 2021 in, in the world of Serbian football. We have some special guests, of course, here, like we do every week. Uh, Luca, my man, how's it going? How's everything uh, with you? <laughs> hey, man. Uh, if it wasn't for these uh, new COVID restrictions, like it's the beginning of the damn uh, pandemic again, it would be great. I'm just kidding, man. I'm doing well, dude. Well enough. Yeah, man. It seems like the last uh, last free place in the world is Florida. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you got to go back to Miami. I know. I know, man. So I'm still looking for uh, tickets right after this podcast. I know. It's a joke. But what, <laughs> what can you do? Uh, Alexa? How's, uh, how's things in Serbia for you? Well, I'm a little bit jealous because I don't get the on the Florida man moniker like Luca is. But uh, in anyways, uh, the Wild Wild West is here well and truly. Uh, there are absolutely no restrictions. People are gathering. The disease is spreading. I'm vaccinated three times over and uh, having a ball. Uh, of course, there was a common coffee cold, which became spread all over the damn city, which put a little bit of a dent on things. But uh, this last gathering makes me very happy. Uh, so we can talk about a great 2021 and uh, a year that's been personally fantastic for me. Uh, and I, I think it was fantastic for anyone who loved football, and I hope it's been great for you guys. And uh, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of good. There was obviously some bad, and a whole lot in between. So we can get started. That's right. And uh, we are supposed to also be joined by our man Veli from uh, Australia as well, but uh, he's still not here. So Veli <laughs> might be way passed out, drunk somewhere. Well, yeah, we'll or... forgive him this time. <laughs> One time. He might, he might. He might pop in ra- randomly. Yeah, exactly. In a couple minutes. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah. So let's just uh, go off the bat here. Uh, as, as you guys mentioned, 2021 has been a crazy, it's a very long year. <laughs> it feels like so many things have happened. And it, it doesn't feel, usually like uh, qualifying takes more than one year. Right. Like, you know, it starts like in 20, it starts the year prior. And then, you know, it's usually a two-year cycle. And, and this time it was like a like an eight-month cycle. You know, we started in March and then we qualified in, uh, in November there. So, uh, you know, it's it's kind of kind of weird. I, I like it better this way. Uh, same here, dude. Same here, man. That was high octane action, dude. I really loved it. Yeah, it was like uh, big game after big game, like every every couple weeks, every month. You know, it's it's a, it was a lot better this way, and, a, and a, it also gave us uh, a lot less time for our team to have like a down period. You know, we always right. have. We start the qualifiers well, and then we go into the end of the season, and it's June, and then you know those June games, we lose to Finland, we lose to Belgium. We, you know, we fuck off against Austria and whatever. So it's, 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 uh, or Ukraine, of course, the mo- most famous June, <laughs> June result for us. Uh, but yeah, you know, this is like shortened, shortened COVID style qualifiers, thanks to the Euros being, you know, delayed a year, really worked out in our favor, I believe. And, and you know, it's, it was a lot, and it, it resorted in an amazing campaign. Um, you know, for, for today's show, we're kind of going to go over the year, see some of our favorite moments, uh, you know, some of our favorite uh, players in, in this year, you know, some of our favorite uh, games maybe as well, and, and what things that we'll remember and, and we'll look back fondly on 2021 for. Um, Luca, when it comes to the national team, uh, what was your main impression for this year and, and your final thoughts on everything? Yeah, man, I mean, like, my, I think my biggest takeaway from the national team was kind of just seeing a a change in attitude and a change in the fighting spirit that I just didn't see the team have before, at least to this degree, and also this consistently. And, you know, that obviously comes all with uh, Stojkovic, and I think just that... Um, that mentality that he's been able to instill in the team in such a short period of time is definitely amazing. And it, and it has me more optimistic than I've ever been for the national team uh, moving forward. So my, my biggest takeaway for, for the national team is I think we've finally taken that next big step in our evolution or in, in kind of like playing to the quality that we have in the team. It's always been like, oh, our manager sucks, but we have the quality or this and that. The FSS sucks, but we have the quality. Now we have the quality, we have the manager, and it looks like, you know, the the other other parts that used to be bringing us down aren't there anymore or as much. So, uh, you know, we, t- we t- took that next step. I think we're still 
a step away, if not, you know, a step and a half away from the really, really big leagues, the really, you know, the world uh, dominators in in um, national team soccer. So I think I think we can definitely get there with Slovakia, and I'm ex- I'm extremely extremely looking forward to see what's in store for us. Yeah, I mean, if somebody told you at the end of 2020 that 2021 was going to go like this, I don't, I don't think you could even, you know, write a better script. <laughs> to no, be exactly. honest, right. you know, undefeated qualifying campaign, um, a 90th minute goal in the last game in Lisbon, Portugal, right. the center of the World Cup. I mean, it's just, just like, you know, it's fairy tale stuff. Hey, hey and, and that, and that was after we conceded in like the third minute too. You know, what I mean, like, like yeah. we talked about this in a previous podcast, but like you can see in the third minute, any other Serbia team would have. The best they could have gotten was a draw from that situation. Forget the win, or they would have got blown out three or four zero. You know, yeah, it would have been a red card. Yeah, some, handball some in nonsense. the box. Yeah, exactly. Dude. So, something for sure. The frustration would, would have, have boiled been, over. But like four guys retiring after the game. <laughs> you know, the usual. Everybody pointing usual fingers. All right. Yeah, <laughs> pointing fingers, going crazy in the media. Yeah, yep. yep. Manager getting fired. But hey, so far, and, and you know, we still haven't fired a manager. You know, we qualified. You, by this time, Muslim is already gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. So, Improvements so everywhere. Got that, we got that on our on our side as well. Uh, so, what about you? Um, for for you, what 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 stands out most from uh, twenty twenty one as a year? Well, I guess we'll go. I guess you know, place by place, we'll go for the clubs and we'll get to the national team. But uh, and I'll start with the national team. Um, definitely a year that was very paradoxical in many ways. In what way do I say that? Um, it is the, like the thing we talked about in previous podcasts. Wonderfully ironic that in a year where our FSS is completely non-existent, when we don't have a president, we don't have anybody in any of the governing bodies, when the rule book has just been completely thrown out the window, um, most countries would be in a state of very crappy affairs because of that. And yet it actually turned out to be a tremendous benefit for us. And the team played the best it's played in a long time when it was uh, away from all the stuff that uh, gets away on the, off the pitch. And um, that's something that we haven't really been used to. Um, it was a paradoxical year in the sense that we were able to break trends. We were able to, for example, against Portugal in the, in the home game, we got a referee call that went our way, which has never happened. And I've watched this team for 15 years. Um, scoring a last-minute winner, which is something that we haven't done, and more importantly, amongst everything else, playing splendid attacking football, which we haven't done, I don't want to say ever, but we haven't done that in a long time. And I think that the thing that was really refreshing, which we mentioned as well in the Portugal podcast right after it ended, was the fact that uh, the decision-making was very sensible, that we followed modern European trends and modern footballing trends, not just in terms of the formations that we played, but in terms of how things were done, in terms of how we, people communicated to the media, it looked very modern. And I think it proved that when people stick together and when there's a coherent, cohesive plan, that we can develop and do things at a great level, which is something that Dushan Tadic said um, in his recipient award when he got the, the award for the best player of the year, uh, which could have been any of the players, but uh, went to him. Um, I think it's been a year that was wonderful in terms of the players that we have playing all around Europe and the, and the Oscar players that we haven't still gotten under Serbian caps. You would know about that, Miller, since you are the main scout, pretty much. Um, but we've seen a lot of guys that are playing in Austria and Germany and you know England, Spain, France, wherever they are, and just how much talent has left this country, and yet they still have the desire to want to play for us or the fact that they're playing all around the world and that they're displaying the desire that they want to compete with us and that they're developing at a high level. I think that's something that gives great future for the long term. And I think that it, it was just a very positive feeling that for the first time in a long time, it felt like that we had the, the public support of, of the mainstream media. I think that when you saw the reactions after the Portugal game, uh, people were really heaping praise on us. And if you've seen that video of all of the commentators reacting to our goals, uh, it's fantastic. All the commentators seemed very excited for us and, and very happy. And just the way we played uh, really convinced a lot of the mainstream public that we can play very pretty football. We played wonderful football. You know, it wasn't just that we scored goals. We played very well along the way. And as somebody mentioned, when you play that way, you're going to buy the support of the neutral, uh, which is something that, you know, Croatia, for example, had during the Russia World Cup. When they were playing against England or they were playing against other countries or Argentina, they were playing splendid football and they got support of the mainstream public on their side, which can be great because 
you guys know that usually we're the underdogs when it comes to crowd support. A lot of times we're going up against the crowd, and it can be a great motivating factor for us, but I think it would be nice to have it flip the other way for a change. Um, I think that it's a year that also, paradoxically, when you look at how the clubs have done, you know, we have a league that's nearing the top 10 leagues in Europe, and yet the state of affairs is dreadful in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of people leaving, in terms of the, the wages not being paid out on time and stuff like that. Uh, and yet we're making tremendous, you know, strides forward in European football. And then also the paradox of trying to build a national stadium when you have some examples like Dukadic and Bacca de Polo, which are great examples of very sensible clubs. And yet we're not building stadiums for a lot of other places that desperately need stadiums. So it's a year that uh, has had many ups and had many downs, but there's been tremendous success along the way. There's been wonderful football played on an individual basis. I think certainly the thing that Sticks out to me as the meteoric rise of Dusan Lakovic in the year he's had, and I think that uh, you know the, the amount of goals he scored in the calendar year. I think he tied or broke the Serie A record for most goals in a year tied. in the calendar year, which is an amazing achievement when you consider all the guys that have played there. You know Ronaldo and Maradona and you know, the, the, the other Ronaldo and uh, you know Francesco Totti and uh, Vieri, Shevchenko. I mean, I can go on. Um, you look at the performances that Mitrovic has had at Fulham and how he's completely settled in playing there and how he's been completely accepted. Uh, and very much appreciated by, by the mainstream public for that. You look at the performances of guys that are French players in the squad, like Ivan Ilyich and Andrzej Zivkovic, and you know, how they're playing in their leagues. You know, the young defenders we have coming up, the amount of depth we have in goal, which we haven't had in a very long time, and um, just very, very great things that happen along the way. It's hard to really pick out words. I might sound like I'm repeating myself, and uh, that I might not be saying the most news-breaking things, but so much has been said, and it's just been incredibly positive, and uh, it's a year that will certainly go down as the most successful year since the breakup of Yugoslavia. I think you can't deny that we have two teams that have gone past stages in their competitions, you know, more or less efficiently, depending on who you ask. But they've they've certainly had successful seasons if you look at it overall. I mean, you wouldn't have expected Sezi to be first in the group uh, for the Europa League, and I don't think anybody expected Partizan to have a five point lead in the league table. So I think in that sense, they've made their they've they've hit their targets in a way, and they've made their accomplishments in the hope is that, uh, that they can keep the players and they can build forward. I think if you look at the financial benefits that you that uh, UEFA is finally starting to give out for the Conference League and the Europa League, that there's great benefits for some of the other teams like Trukadicki and Vojvodina and Patrikotopola to make strides forward so that we can make it a semi-competitive league because there's a lot of potential here. I think that when you talk to people, for example, I have a, a very good friend of mine, um, Dusan Maminovic, who works for Hammerby. He, he's the coach in one of the youth ranks and he's got a UEFA license and all that. And he works in Sweden, and he's told me that a lot of times people look at our players as much more naturally talented and that they've got a great desire to succeed. But then unfortunately, because of the lack of infrastructure and the lack of proper funding, uh, that they lack the ability to develop and to finish products. Uh, if we were able to get our league to that level, whether it would be through shortening the league to 10 or 12 teams, or it would just be through improving the marketing or many other things, you would see a league that actually... Uh, can be right there with the likes of the Ukrainian and Scottish and other leagues, which are very well respected on the Belgian league, for example. And uh, I think that despite the year we've had, there's still a lot of potential to go forward. Of course, there's the fear that because of the lack of competent people in most of the positions in Serbian football, that potential will go unrealized. But uh, when you look at the fact that Pixie's at the helm and he's pretty much everything, like you said, Milos, in, in one of the last episodes, um, I think it gives great hope that uh, people will realize the potential we have that it can return football as to being amongst the pinnacle of a very sports-oriented culture because football, despite the fact that it's not our most successful sport, is probably still alongside basketball, neck and neck, if not even slightly ahead, as our number one sport. And the fact that we're finally starting to achieve that potential after a lot of years is, is very refreshing and very hopeful for the future, especially when you look at uh, the age of the team. A lot of the guys are still not even in their 30s and they haven't even hit their prime. Uh, there's still space for teams to take steps forward and improve and, and develop. And when you look at the fact that football is really the only profitable sport uh, that you can seriously make money off of, uh, I think that it brings great hope. It also brings great dangers. We know that money is something that uh, us Serbs were very uh, kind of uh, – we can easily get deteriorated when it comes to that, and a lot of motives can get murky because of it, but I hope that uh, the good outweighs the bad on it. Certainly, results-wise, it's been fantastic, and um, all of that's left is just to count down the days until we lift the World Cup trophy in Qatar. I think that's uh, all I have to say. That's right. And, yeah, you guys have mentioned it. It has been a really amazing year. One of the best years in the history of Serbian football, I would say for sure. I mean, the national team winning the group the way they did and qualifying for the World Cup, Zvezda and Partizan both in the knockout stages and spring football. Um, our league, 
on the basically about to secure a direct spot in, in the Champions League a year from now. I mean, this is this is stuff that you know was kind of nobody would have really thought this was going to happen even even last year. You know, let alone a couple of years ago. So it it really is amazing, and this is you know it's just quite quite the rise that we're on right now. And as we know, any moment everything can go absolutely wrong <laughs> because that is the nature of where we're from and, and Serbia in general. And we all know history and the volatility and, and, and the randomness and the bipolarness of you know things in, and things in our country, unfortunately. But uh, at the same time, you know we have to enjoy this ride while it's here. Uh, there's no point of you know, l- lamenting on, on the negative things and just waiting for it all to, you know, go to hell. Well, why not just enjoy it while it's here? And I know oftentimes, you know, Serbs, we like to be pessimistic and, and just, 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 you know, wait for something to go wrong. And inevitably it does go wrong. But, you know, for now, you know, why, why think about that? You know, this, is, this has been an amazing year and I believe it's going to be even better next year. And why, unless, you know, unless this whole COVID thing, um, continues to be crazy and things go uh, go haywire, but let's hope that doesn't happen and that we have an even better 2022 and that we finally get out of the group stage at the World Cup and achieve a, a, you know, a result that the whole world can be an assumption of and, and can you know build our reputation and our, uh, our name back to where it should be, uh, back to where it was you know, 30 years ago and, or 20 years ago, you know, 1998 or the last time, or 19 and 80 2000, you know, last time we were really viewed as a, as a serious side, as one of the top sides in Europe. You know, I, I believe we have the talent to be one of the top sides in Europe, and we showed it in, in the last game of the qualifiers when we outplayed Portugal in Lisbon, and I think we could, you know, keep building on that, and, you know, we have the right man in charge now. There's no excuses. We have an amazing squad. Again, no excuses. This is our time, and we have to take advantage of it. Now, I know... There's also, you know, there is some news though that we we kind of not talked about uh, as well. Um, of course, uh, you know, football related and you know us related, Serbian football, Serbian footy related. I feel like we should mention the start of the show that our account on Twitter was suspended. <laughs> for, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so you know, we should definitely get into that. Sorry, I just had a child. Have not had a lot of sleep. <laughs> Hey, so, we, we forgive so you. We forgive have, you. Uh, yeah, things have kind of slipped my mind, but yeah, we should definitely. I know we had a lot of questions about that, and, and a lot of people commenting on the videos and, and on Twitter about what happened and wanting to know kind of the story. So uh, I'll go through that right now. So yeah, uh, you know, last week I got an email from Twitter saying that uh, we received three copyright strikes from Adana Sports uh, for videos. You know, one of the, or two of the videos were posted like two or three years ago. Uh, and back then, you know, anybody that's on Twitter knows that they weren't even deleting the videos back then. You know, everybody was posting, uh, you know, highlights from the Superliga and stuff like that on Twitter from Arena Sport, and they weren't deleting any of that back then. May so, I mention that you got those tricks back to back to back? Yeah, exactly. So generally, you have three warnings on Twitter, so you, they'll strike you three times before they suspend your account. So uh, what they did is they, they gave me three strikes at once, so my account was suspended right away. So they did three separate videos back to back to back to back. And, you know, and, and bam, you know, my account was gone. And thankfully, um, I was able to reach out to Arena Sport and also a lot of comments from people on Twitter uh, calling them out, saying, you know, uh, what have you guys done? What do you guys have done? You know, you got, you, you got the, you know, the, one, of the, one of the top uh, Serbian football accounts and Serbian accounts in general taken off uh, Twitter and, and there's a lot of backlash and a lot of people commenting which you really do appreciate because I think that went a long way uh, so at end sport did look into it and then I, I was able to get the information of, of their copyright lawyer who was uh, the one who you know filed those strikes and I talked to him and, and he was able to contact Twitter for me and get them reversed so the account is unbanned now uh, it is still uh, technically we're still banned uh, we're shadow banned so the account is there. I can post on it, but we're not back in the algorithm yet. So uh, most people won't see the tweets. So uh, by next week, it should be all good. We should be back to normal. We should be uh, posting again. Uh, so, yeah, again, uh, really appreciate the support. Appreciate everybody uh, speaking out. I, I know, you know, I, I made a secondary account just to kind of let people know what happened. And 
you know, we have a couple thousand followers on that one already, which is, which is amazing. So I'm really grateful for that. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm not sure. Didn't really see that coming. I guess we made too many negative comments on here about, uh, <laughs> about the FSS and the government. And, you know, also you got to stop talking about Wichita or keep getting, uh, keep getting banned on here, man. What's going on? Good luck with that. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. yeah. As, as a side note, just real quick, everybody should follow the secondary account just in case something like this happens again, you know, and we should probably like tweet exactly. it as soon as you're, you know, uh, unshadow banned or whatever, just so there's a second source for Serbian footy information just in case something yeah, like this happens. Yeah, I'm going to make the secondary account because, you know, it has like 2,000 something followers right now. I'm going to make it like the account of this podcast. So I'll just post podcast stuff on there. And if that ever happens again yeah we'll just have that account ready to go and then you know until the other one gets unbanned again but yeah hopefully that never happens again um you know for a moment there i know i've known a lot of other accounts that have been suspended and never never got their account back right accounts that were large that have big followings and, and put in years of effort into growing that community and and i thought it was going to be <laughs> going to be one of those accounts as well you know i've had this account now for you know close to 10 years have a pretty large community, a pretty you know loyal community, and I think a really great, knowledgeable community. So it would have been really awful if that was taken away for something so you know so minor. I mean, like right. really one of the videos. One of the videos was like a a goal, like where's the Strukarički goal? You know? <laughs> like, that, that had like forty five likes. Like who cares? Like I don't even know why they're they're like trying to make it harder for people to follow Serbian football. Uh, I mean, isn't, isn't the point of doesn't only want don't they want the sport to grow? Nobody right. on Twitter is making money off you know posting a highlight from the Superliga. Yeah. At all, like nobody's making money off that. I think a lot of these companies it would be better off you know letting people post small clips and highlights to build up the, their popularity because you know I'm I'm pretty sure all my tweets have way more engagement interactions and views than the arena sport tweets that they put out so oh, i, I love the flexing i love yeah. it I love it's it. true though it's it's true though they, they, they're i mean it's just a fact so I, I don't know why they're so you know negative against that you know i mean and they just they're the ones that just spent 600 million on on the rights to the to the premier league games so you know clearly got the money you don't need to they're not exactly strapping for cash yeah they're not struggling for cash you know nobody's stealing money from them I'm not making. I wasn't making any money off those tweets. I was literally promoting, uh, you know, what they're trying to promote. Right. Uh, you know, maybe and maybe promoting Arena are... Sport as well, right? I'm sure their fucking exactly. logo was in the thing. So it's like, yeah, yeah. They just, they just. I think they just have like an old school mentality of uh, taking stuff down. They don't understand the the bigger impacts of you know marketing or social media or just the community effect that you're trying to promote them as well as what they're showing on there. So if people are interested in the Serbian Super League, they have to go to Arena Sport to watch it anyway. Exactly, and I think in a lot of other sports, look at the NBA. The NBA lets you post highlights. Right. You go on YouTube. YouTube is full of like NBA compilations, right. NHL compilations, uh, NFL as well. Like you go on Twitter, you see uh, random people posting NFL highlights, NBA highlights, NHL highlights, UFC highlights, all that stuff. Like, so I, I don't know why it's not just a random sport, but it seems a lot of football as well. It's all so, mm-hmm. um. You know, the only people that can post it's very restricted, very very restricted. restricted. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. I mean, it, the NBA is, in my opinion, the most popular league in the world, and part of that is because it's so easily accessible. I mean, anybody can make a highlight video. You know, you go online, you can see Alex, Alex Caruso two minute, you know, dunk video or whatever, right? Uh, by some random guy on Twitter, and I think that's that's you know that's that's part of what makes it, it amazing. You know, you have to use these people online and these communities and these influencers to kind of build that brand and make it even more popular. And a lot of leagues and businesses have, you know, learned how to do that properly and to use it to their advantage. And then football for some reason is just doing the opposite and, <laughs> and hurting the people who are trying to help them the most. And, you know, I've seen a lot of great accounts gone and disappeared and were discouraged and censored for, for things like that. It's really unfortunate. I mean, you know, we all, we all watch those, like, breakdown highlight videos of certain players. I know, like, one of our followers, Zarela, he always does those videos as well. And I think his account, his old account, got suspended for that, and he hasn't gotten it back yet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully we can see in the future, like, the football world be a little more accepting and a little more reasonable when it comes to things like this. Because none of these people are 
making money or maybe you know people who post videos on youtube they might make some money off it but on twitter no nobody's making money off this they're just doing it because they're trying to promote the game and promote what they're interested in and and you know and, and they're just stopping them from doing that which is unfortunate i would like to, to kind of speak on this a little bit more broadly if you don't mind because i actually have some first-hand experience in this um i actually was trying and have been trying for a while uh, to make sort of like a short film or some type of a short documentary um, regarding the national team, and I've had a bunch of various ideas that have uh, that have gone with that. Uh, that I've tried to do. First of all, before I get into that, I do want to just, in the name of all of us, even though you said it, Milos, really just a huge thank you. Um, you know, and I'm not just saying this is someone who has the fortune of being on the podcast, and uh, I'm saying this is someone who was a follower before I ever got on the podcast. The community that you built, um, and that uh, you know, you've you've built, and we've had a hand in building as well. It's probably, as, as other people have said, one of the best nation-related footballing communities on Twitter and on social media. I mean, you saw the reaction from the Olympic Tacos podcast, the Luxembourg podcast, <clears throat> the Armenian podcast as well, the Portuguese podcast. A lot of guys went out and uh, even in Serbian mainstream media really gave a huge effort to, to bring the account back. And I think it shows the strength of the community. We were from Argentina and Spain and Africa and various different places. And I think it shows the possibility that we have, the reach that we have. I think it shows a stamp of approval of the content that you produced, Milos, and that we've tried to help you in that way. And uh, I think it, it shows the potential that, that Serbian football has in general, because we're not a country that's, uh, I guess, very much in, in, in tune. You would expect maybe Greece or Belgium or some of the other countries to have a lot of followers, but it turns out if you look at the nation-specific uh, Twitter accounts, that we're, you know, we're amongst the, the, the top, you know, if we're not the, the number one account. You know, I'm excluding, I guess, the top, top five. The nation, top five, top I think, five. for sure. So that, that's a huge stamp of approval, and it's not an easy thing to do, especially on Twitter. And you look at Serbian media, Twitter is something that a lot of Serbia just doesn't have. I mean, half the country is not uh, technologically advanced enough to have it. I think maybe only a quarter of the population actually uses it actively. So to get 20,000 followers off of that is a huge accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out is that what you said about the other sports, um, it is getting a little bit more restrictive with the NFL and the NBA. They're kind of starting to kind of you know throw copyright strikes here and there but they're still way more uh i would say uh lenient when it comes to it they still allow some sort of creative expression they still allow commentary videos and spoofs and parodies and stuff like that uefa and fifa are extremely rigorous when it comes to it i have uh dedicated myself to to an account uh, doing recaps of all these and games and it's a passion project as, as all of this is all the things that we've done this podcast is a passion project and uh, all the things that have gone on on Twitter are because people love the game. We gladly do it. You do it loudly, Luca, uh, Milos. Everyone else gladly does it. Veli does it, uh, waking up early in the morning because he, he loves the game. I think you need people like that. I think you need support like that to really be able to grow your brand. And I think that when you look at one of the biggest problems that Serbian football has in general is just the lack of marketing money and the lack of finance that exists here. I think that this kind of stuff might seem minuscule, but I think it's, it's something that can be very detrimental long term because, for example... The Polish league has, I think they had a marketing deal for 150 or 160 million euros. And the Polish league, we would all agree, is not better than our league. The, the top team in Poland would not beat our top teams. And more than likely, it's it's not as entertaining. And their fans are, you know, at the very least, it's comparable. But they're making 160 million. And I don't know if clubs here are getting 30 or 40 million for it you know, total. And I think that marketing money is something that helps clubs tremendously. And it relieves the pressure from the top clubs from not having to win every game because as the partisan, for example, if you look at their finances, a lot of it comes from UEFA money. A lot of it comes from, you know, rewards from getting out of the group stage. A lot of it comes from transfer sales and stuff like that. There's very little marketing money involved. One of the ways in which marketing can grow is by pushing it on platforms, by allowing clips to be shared, which, by the way, uh, as I said, it's, it's something that allows you to promote yourself. It's something that can only bring good name to you, and whether it's good promotion or bad promotion, so long as people aren't stealing it. It can only be good for them. And the fact that they're – and another part that's, that's hilarious in all this is that FS, who you would think is the most rigorous in all of this, is actually the most flexible because when I've done recaps of games, I've never gotten – or very rarely have I gotten any sort of a warning or a copyright strike from FS or the content ID system, which exists, uh, which is a robot that uh, basically flags all your content. But FS is very lenient when it comes to it and like do most of whatever you want. But it's these modern companies – that, are, that want to take every single cent. And as you said, they spent $600 million for the Premier League rights. They're certainly not strapped for cash. So it's something that's very frustrating because I think that the, the, the passion that we use for it, I think, can be 
developed into something that can be a great money making opportunity for clubs. I think you look at the Yavarmatis Twitter account and the other Twitter accounts that have been growing in the Serbian league, they, they are comparable with the likes of Augsburg and Zen and another really popular social media accounts of clubs that are on Twitter. And I think that you can use that to gain a significant base of followers. I think that, uh, you know, talking about football in general, it's the biggest sport in the world and it's something that captivates people. And I think that to be so restrictive about it, you know, even FIFA already giving people hard enough time because of it, there's no reason for uh, our people uh, to be even more restrictive about it. Not to mention the fact that they, they flag literally everything. And, and the fact that uh, the Arena Sport guy said that he didn't do, have anything to do with it, it's just, you know, very insulting. He's lying to your face about it. And uh, I think they need to wisen up because of it. I think they would see that it's good for them. I think that it's something that would help the league tremendously. I think if the marketing improved and I think if the league was fixed in that way and if more income was able to uh, show up in terms of promoting the clubs in the way that the football media works in general, not just in our country, but in the, in the wider region, I think that it would be beneficial for a lot of the smaller clubs to get some money because of it. Um, Offer Club Elgin, for example, is getting some money for the tickets just because of how well they've been doing in the lower leagues. And people are coming to their games, and because they made a good story in the media, uh, it's been helping them. And I think it shows the power that media can have in a good way. And I think it sucks that they they, they took down the Twitter profile, but we're very happy that all the people spoke up and uh, and brought it back. And uh, all the only thing that we can promise is that we're going to try our very best and Milish. Uh, as somebody who's been by far the most important reason why the account's done so well, and uh, I have had a very small, and privileged to say I've had a small, very minuscule part in it, along with Luke and Veli and other people that have had a much bigger part than I have. Uh, all we can do is hope and promise that uh, the quality is going to continue to come and that uh, people are going to stick around and listen to us rant and be happy and, and things like that. And uh, every share, every like, every tweet, every comment is, is greatly appreciated. And uh, again, just thank you to everyone who brought the account back. and. Uh, Hopefully the people that uh, that took the account down realize the potential that this account has and that other accounts might have as well because there's a lot of people in this country that, uh, contrary to popular belief, actually do know a lot about football and can make entertaining content. They just need to be given the creative freedom and the expression to do it. And uh, I think it would be very beneficial long-term for, for our football. Absolutely. And, yeah, for sure, uh... Alexa, thank you for the kind words and also also for your contributions as well as Luca and Nelly and everybody else who's helped over the years. Uh, yeah, thankfully the account will be back shortly. So I, I do thank uh, Rena Sport and Asia Media Group for that. Um, you know, still think you know what they did was very unnecessary and just just not counterproductive to what everybody's trying to do, which is help grow the game, make it more popular, make it more accessible, and you know, just just don't see why they needed to do that. But hopefully this is the last time this happens and, and that, you know, we'll be uh, tweeting free and clear from uh, now on. And uh, and as well, I just want, want to thank everybody one more time for all the kind comments, the kind words, and also, you know, the, the hateful messages <laughs> towards uh, Arena Sports. Uh, for, Some of them were very juicy. <laughs> yeah. And also, I just want to shout out that one guy had the one negative comment. He said that uh, the account... Deserve to be suspended because we said that uh, Milan Boran was a sometimes was a legend. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but that was hilarious. So shout out to you, buddy. Uh, hopefully you were joking, but if you weren't, I mean, this is just our opinions, right? So I'm not well, here. the things that have gone on the last couple of weeks, I think that might become debatable. But uh, I don't know if we want to get, yeah. get into that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, even even if even if how however ugly this gets or whatever, I mean, you can't argue that. He was pretty much the main reason why a lot of success in Europe happened. You know, his saves in the last minute have resulted in countless results and countless amounts of money for the club. So I think over time, regardless of how this whole thing ends, he will be, you know, looked back upon as a legend and as one of the best goalkeepers to play for the club. Uh, but again, everything is my opinion, our opinion. It's all opinion. You know, I don't expect that everybody to agree with me or to have the same thoughts, but it's just how I feel. And, and I hey, we feel should right. organize that Twitter space and let everyone come in and have 120 listeners or whatever and <laughs> yeah. make their comments. And they can do a job better than I can. That would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it is what it is. But again, thank you so much, everyone. We are back and, and, and the Twitter will be back and better than ever, trying to up the content and, and make things even better. Um, you know, something like this has only motivated us to do better and to create better things and i think you know in 2022 we'll we'll see that you know we'll have a better podcast a better twitter account and a better engagement in general and i think it'll be our best year of growth yet 
and hopefully, you know, the success of the national team will uh, help that. Because <laughs> if the team's doing good, right. then, you know, the accounts are doing good as well. And um, also, yeah, I mean, also a couple things you haven't talked about, like the uh, pairings for the Nations League next year. We haven't really talked about our group <laughs> yet. Um, we we're drawn into our group for, for League B for Nations League, which starts in June. We, ha- we pretty much have the hardest group, I would say. Uh, well, I think pretty much. I think we definitely have the hardest group in, in our league with Sweden, as well as uh, Norway and Slovenia, our old nemesis Slovenia, which we seem to draw every time. Uh, we owe them a lot. <laughs> we owe them a lot for that ridiculous uh, loss in the qualifying for Euro 2012. Uh, Dada and, and the the midget uh, Boyan Nagashvich in goal, <laughs> who, who let the ball go in from, from the halfway line on, on that stupid kick that I can still picture in my head right now. <laughs> um, yeah, very tough group. Uh, will be some good tests and some good preparation for the World Cup. Uh, Luca, what are your thoughts on our, our Nations League group and what we can expect from that? Yeah, man, I, I agree with you. I think it is the toughest group in, in League B here. And I, I, I also kind of am glad we did get the toughest group. Because, you know, obviously we're going to be playing this Nations League before the World Cup. So getting into that mindset of just winning and, and facing good competition um, regularly instead of, you know, being able to take a deep breath, I think that's only going to help us. And especially in the trajectory that we're on right now, um, I think I think having this group is beneficial. With all that being said, though, I still expect to be first in the group um, and go towards uh, League A and secure a, uh, you know, backdoor entry into the uh, Euro Euro qualifiers if needed. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, we saw this last time, right? The only reason we had a chance to qualify for the last Euros was because the playoff didn't go so well in the end, but it, it was still a secondary chance and hopefully this time we won't need it. Uh, but I agree with you. It is a bit more beneficial to be playing teams like, teams like Sweden, Norway, and Slovenia as opposed to you know, Lithuania, Montenegro, and Romania that we had in the last Nations League, right. which were, which were you know, a level below. Maybe not Romania, they're still a decent side, but, you know, Montenegro and, and Lithuania are, 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 I believe, far below teams like Sweden and, and even Norway. Uh, so we'll see what happens in that group. Alex, what, what are your thoughts on, on our group and, and the upcoming Nations League? I think the group is going to be a very interesting test. Um, I am glad we got this group, by the way. I definitely agree with Luke on that. I think that the an important paradox mentality that, that we all want the easiest group but when you look at it actually um, what we realistically need are, are good preparation games and we need good opponents to prepare us for what awaits us um, I talked about this before how our record during the summer when the season's over or when it's nearing its end uh, usually ends up being a lot worse than March or September when our players are still in form and uh, when they're still playing so I think in that sense it's going to be a good test to see whether the team can maintain its focus at four match days um, during the, the June period, uh, which is going to be good. And I think the teams we drew as well could be could be very good, uh, very good ways to prepare. I think that uh, uh, certainly the Slovenian game is the one that uh, is going to be very important because of the track record. I think we played against them five times and not on one win, and all of those draws and losses have come in very painful and bitter fashion. And I think it's time that we, we got back at them after so many years. And Sweden and Norway, I mean, look, Sweden's probably – of the teams that we could have potentially drawn in the playoffs, we talked about how they're one of the few teams that we maybe didn't want to draw because of not just the fact that they play a very physical brand of football, but also because they play together for a long time. They have enough talent to where a single individual move that they have can decide a game and win a match for them. Um, they play a very rigorous, conservative brand of football, which is, I guess, a lot different to the style of football we have. I think it's good. I think it's good. We're going to go up against a team that might set up shop and, and defend and not be willing to, I don't want to say defend, but they'll be willing to uh, make the game more dull. I don't think that they want to play against the tempo that we have and have Kostic and Lazovic and Lazovic and all the other guys, Flakovic as well, running down the wings and uh, attacking them. I think they're going to want to make it a dull game. Norway is another great one because anytime you can beat the breaks off Erling Holland, it's it's a nice thing and it's going to be another proof that Vlakovic is clearly better than him as he's always <laughs> been. And uh, I think it's a good test for them. I think that, uh, you know, th- th- they might not be the opponents that we could get when you look at the probability for the World Cup pots. There's a bigger chance than not that those are not the type of teams we're going to play against because we've got against the likes of Mexico or right. Denmark or somebody like that. They're going to be much more expansive teams. They're going to be willing to play a bit, and in that sense, it might be frustrating. But also, I think it could be a good preparation if, let's say, because we're more than likely going to be in the third pot. 
that we're going to get a pop four team that's going to be willing to sit back and make it a tough game. It can be a great preparation for that. It can be an opportunity to see some of the guys that take steps forward, like uh, Markovic or uh, Marko Vilic in the Belgian League. Other guys can get their opportunities. I think a few positions can be secured. And uh, I can expect the games are going to be against teams that you have to respect. All three teams, Slovenia had a tremendous Nations League period. Norway's a team that's got enough talent to where you have to respect them, even if they might play no football. And Sweden was in it until the very last moment and really should have won the group uh, that Spain that they were in with Spain until they, they blew it at the end. So I think it can be a very good thing. I'm, and the thing I'm hoping for more than likely uh, is that the fans show up. I think that if there was ever a time, uh, for the fans to really fill the stands and, and give support to the players. That would be the time period. It's mm. going to be in June. Uh, the weather hopefully is going to be good. You know, there's not going to be any sort of pressure. Uh, it's a good chance for the team to prepare. Uh, it, it's a really, I think it can be something that can be really beneficial and, and a really useful long term. I expect us to be in contention for first place. You have to respect Sweden because playing in Sweden is never easy. And playing in Slovenia on that pitch is never easy as well. So, we have three away games that might be difficult, but all the away games we could have gotten difficult. You know, you could have gone to Ukraine. You could have had some of the uh, rivalries uh, in the region, whether it was Albania or whether it was Montenegro or whatever. So we got a group that I think is just right, and I think is a very good opportunity for us to showcase that we can evolve and that we can dispatch teams uh, when we're the favorites, because we're more than likely going to be the favorites in this group. And I think it can be very good practice for us. And uh, you know, alongside that, I'm just hoping to see that all the players are fit and the players get injured in that period. And that uh, we possibly have good friendlies in the March window, if the March window exists. And uh, just to wait for the draw. I think that the draw, if we do get teams that uh, play similar to their style of football, like the teams I just mentioned in the Nations League, I think oh, then it really becomes a very important thing because we can prepare very well, even though the probabilities of the World Cup pots uh, dictate that the teams we're going to get are going to be much more attacking. But all in all, I'm very excited. And uh, I hope that the stands are full because I think the team really deserves it. Barring, of course, some... You know, unforeseen catastrophe, but I don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, and, and as you mentioned, it's going to be a great opportunity to test some players out. I know we don't need another goalkeeper, but Mark Vilic has been doing amazing uh, in, in the Belgian league. He's got the most clean sheets in the league. He's doing very well. A great young. Not to mention that he's more than likely the best guy with the, the ball playing mm-hmm. goalkeepers. He's probably yeah. the best one. So, yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're uh, goalkeeper rich right now. You know, there's a bunch of guys that can get a chance and, and see what they can do in, in those games. And I think, of course, Pixie will want the results, especially heading into the World Cup. He's going to want that confidence boost. He's going to want us to, to establish our dominance and to keep building on what we've done so far. And we haven't lost a competitive game yet under him. So I don't think he's going to want to experiment too much or risk too much. Uh, in, in these games, uh, he has shown, you know, with the games against Qatar and other friendlies that he's not afraid to just test out, you know, random random teams and, and throw guys and give them a chance. You know, every time he's called someone up, he's given them a chance. So I expect a lot of people to get chances in these games. And uh, at the end of the day, it will be very tough. Sweden is an excellent team. Maybe not, you know, a, a fire a firepower, a team full of firepower, even though Zlatan is still playing. But... They're not really a high-scoring team or an exciting team, but they're really very well organized. Uh, they've been together for a while. They know how to play. They know how to grind out results. And it will be very tough for us against them, especially you know the away game. And uh, Norway, an emerging side, seems like they kind of they were they they could have qualified. Uh, you know, if they had gotten a result in that last game against uh, the Netherlands, they could have been in the playoffs. So they're they're no slouches either. And of course, Slovenia. They have been struggling for some years now. Uh, their, you know, their old generation has gone. They're they're well past their primes now. You know the the uh, those guys like uh, uh, Kurtic and Ilicic and those guys. You know they're kind of on the way out. And now they have some younger players who they're trying to establish. And it seems like they've kind of had a a bit of a talent drought as well in the last uh, ten or so years. But uh, they have been improving as well. And they'll definitely be up for the game against us. They're always up for it against us, <laughs> but it will be, you know, it'll be good. Uh, annoyingly be, so. Yeah, annoyingly <laughs> so. I mean, you know, get out of here, Slovenia. <laughs> but I, I know there'll be a lot of Serbs, you know, going to that game. So it'll be a nice atmosphere for us. I'm sure there'll be a lot of Serbs in Sweden as well in that game because there's a large community of us there, and also in Norway, a good number of Serbs that live there. Um, so you know, it should be a good crowd for all these games. 
and I expect, accept the good, I expect a good crowd in Belgrade as well as uh, the team has won some faith back from the fans. So hopefully we can uh, build on that and go into the, the World Cup with some confidence and also, you know, go into Euro qualifying in 2023 with some confidence as well and, and a spot in, in the playoffs if need be. Um, now, I guess to kind of cap off the show, we can review some things that happened in the year. So a couple couple questions and then we can all give our, give our answer to. So I'll start with... Uh, who was your uh, top Serbian player of 2021? Your top moment? And uh, I guess your who were you kind of like most disappointed in? Like you thought somebody was going to take the next step and they really kind of stayed the same or they, they disappeared and didn't take the next step. Um, so, Luca, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. All three questions. All three at once. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> so, let's see. Top player... You know, guys, you guys know I love I love Dusan Tadic, but in this this year I have to give it to to my man uh, Vlahovic, dude. I uh, just very very impressive year. Played great for the national team. Played even better, obviously, for Fiorentina. Um, you know, thirty three goals in one calendar year, tying Cristiano Ronaldo. At how old is he? Twenty one years old. You know, that's just those are just things that don't happen. And for us to have a striker of that caliber playing in one of the Top five leagues and tying a legend, you know, arguably the greatest of all time, Cristiano Ronaldo, who also played in in Syria. I mean, that is that's pretty amazing. So, uh, best player for me in this last year, uh, the homie Dusan Vlahovic. Next one, what was it? Best moment? Yeah, best moment. Yeah. Best moment. I mean, I, I don't know if we'll, we'll probably all pick the same one, but obviously it's hard to beat the uh, Dimitrovic, you know, <laughs> freaking uh, last minute header in Lisbon to send us to the World Cup. I mean, I don't know how anybody else can pick that one, and if anybody else does pick that one, I know you'll be. It doesn't pick that one. I know you'll be lying. Uh, and then the the last one, who I'm most disappointed in. <laughs> Look, the biggest disappointment. It doesn't have to be a player, but like okay. the biggest disappointment in well, general in Serbian football. Yeah. I you know I could go on about the 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 governance and everything and and the structure of, of Serbian football is when it comes to the Superliga and everything, but I will say I have two disappointments. One is a player and one is just in general. In general, I'm still disappointed in the the attendance that that, that we have for the national team. I mean I know like that that Qatar game that was I think before the Portugal game that the friendly that we had and. We had, you know, maybe 2,000 people in the stands to see us off in the biggest biggest game that we've had in years for the national team. Um, so I'm a little bit disappointed in that. Hopefully, I'm with you. I'm with you, Alexa. Hopefully that really changes in this Nations League. And, you know, they now got the fan support back. And, you know, we start packing the stadium because it's a beautiful thing when that stadium is packed and the national team is playing. I mean, I remember um, Antic... When when he was coach and and we played Romania in Belgrade and that stadium was buzzing man the energy was was amazing and I just want to see that again for for a national team you can tell it means so much to the players you can tell it means so much to Stoichovic maybe even more because of the way that he goes and goes out of his way to say thank you to the fans every time after every game so um I really I really I really hope Alexa that was a great point you made and I really hope I really hope it comes to fruition that our fans back this team because this team deserves their their backing um and then the last the, just a player that i'm disappointed in is on my man uh, radonic uh and and the reason is because i i feel like i i've been waiting for him to break out ever since his yes this season uh before he got sold or he was uh, magnificent in europe and I, i've just been waiting for him to break out at a team and really show his true potential and uh but he just consistently is the most frustrating guy to watch uh you know he delivers a awesome assist to 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 cause us to tie it up on that breakaway in in belgrade when we played up portugal but then uh you know next three games he's nowhere nowhere to be seen even though he's played you know in 90 minutes so it's like it, it it seems to me his problem is mental i know he's still relatively young and but you can tell he has the skills to be a fantastic player the way he plays like it just take, takes people on um so yeah, man, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I really hope that my my boy uh, Radonjic um, picks it up, uh, and then like we can talk about him in a better light and give him some more praise because I think he has the skills to to get the praise. That's right. You know, his consistency 
is <laughs> often the issue. But man, you know what? If only he can get his play as consistent as his fashion and his haircuts. <laughs> as his drip, we're, we're we're flying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <We're> flying. <laughs> Alex, uh, what are what are your uh, your votes there for the questions? Well, I guess it, it wouldn't really make sense to finish off on a bad note, so I'm going to start off with the most disappointing one, get it out of the way. Hard to think of a player. I, 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 of these, I guess, would make sense, but I think that he's taken, you know, time to try and fix things up in Pika. He has been getting some minutes, and, uh, you know, some Portuguese fans have been clamoring for him to play, so uh, I guess he might be least disappointing. Uh, it is a little bit disappointing that Sadie still hasn't left Lazio, and, uh, you know, they're still trying to shoehorn that move with all the... New rules that FIFA have imposed, and agents not uh, being able to get more than 10% for a transfer, so I'm assuming that they're, he's, he's going to stay there. They're going to force him move very soon. It is unfortunate. I mean, I know he loves Lazio, and he's been playing great there, but uh, we were all hoping for that next step to take. And now when you look back on everything that went on during the Russia World Cup, it, 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 it seems all the more inexplicable because you would think he would have moved by now. But uh, in any case, the, the biggest disappointment, I would say, um, very hard to say this, and it was it was there's a lot of people that we could have chosen for this, but I have to unfortunately be harsh on my own boys, even though I love them, and I'm gonna have to pick Partizan. And the reason for it is the inability to pay uh, another one that other medical costs. Um, the former Partizan goalkeeper played for six or seven years, you know, was a goalkeeper in the Champions League and uh, helped to win titles and things like that. Uh, solid goalkeeper was you know made mistakes, but was was a good guy and. Uh, I think he's been dealing with uh, maybe cancer or something. I don't remember exactly what the, the medical condition is, but uh, you know, the way they've gone about it, they've been begging people to to support him and you know to send messages. He's great and all, but the fact that they, by many accounts, haven't been doing nearly enough to help pay his medical bills is something that's very annoying. I know that a lot of money is missing from the club. I know that a lot of times they live in financial hardship, but I know that it can be very frustrating, and I know that it can be very difficult, but the fact that you can't take care of one on your own is one of the things that, that I loved about Partizan, one of the things that uh, I, I cherished is the fact that the club very rarely left its former players and former legends in a state of flux when they didn't have money and they didn't have anywhere else to live. And whether it was former coaches or former players or even fans, for example, they, the, the club really always tried to take care of their own. You know, Zvezda unfortunately had that issue. Uh, if you remember the, the team that uh, went to the UEFA Cup final, for example, in 1979, a lot of those guys uh, lived in very, very modest lives despite making a lot of money and a lot of former players uh, weren't taken care of. So it's unfortunate that, that we've stood that low. I mean, it is a human life at stake. And, uh, you know, he, he's fighting for it. And a lot of people have, have texted messages and have given a lot of money to help. And, uh, you know, he's fighting like hell. And we're all hoping that he beats it. But uh, it's something that really should have been taken care of by now. So that's the disappointing out of the way. Uh, best player, uh, I would have to say, despite... The great year that Dusan Vlaku just had, and it is a record-setting year. And despite the magnificence of Dusan Tadic, I still think that what Mitrovic was able to do this year, when you compare it to where he was last year when he was at the bottom of the barrel, the importance he played during this qualifying period and the importance he's played for Fulham in general. I mean, they're first in the championship. They're playing splendid football. He's managed to survive all the criticism that's gone his way, and, and he's stuck it out and he's the main man there the goals he scored in the qualifier were not just important goals they were they were beautiful goals he became the record setting goal scorer got the goal that got us to the world cup score one of the best goals i've ever seen in my life uh, which is that chip against ireland and i think that mm. uh, the effort that he's given as well and uh, you know how he's how he's handled himself and conducted himself the whole way has been nothing short of absolutely magnificent the support that he's given to the fans uh, has really been top notch and uh, he's captain material and that's one of the things that Jose Mourinho said is that not everyone that has the captain armband is the captain of the team. And I'm not trying to discredit Dushan Tadic in any way, but Mito is the guy who's really been the heart and soul of his team and has dragged us and kept us floating above water when a lot of things haven't gone well. And I think he deserves it uh, just for pure effort and just for how well he's played as well. And uh, the best moment, I think, has to go to the whole national team, not for the goal in Portugal, even though that is the footballing moment, but certainly uh, for two wonderful moments of... of uh, selflessness that uh, whether you think that they were forced into it or whether they acted on their own volition uh, the money that they got from winning the, the, the you know the game in Portugal which is you remember very infamously there was a promise that they're going to get a million euros uh, there's a lot of report that that money went to charity and certainly the foolproof story which has been completely proven was the money that uh, all the guys paid for a lot of the retro jerseys uh, for the um, health costs of this kid Luca I forget his last name apologies but he's had a very difficult time 
uh, dealing with a sickness and uh, all the guys stepped up and uh, you know paid money for for his for jerseys and uh, you know paid for his medical bills and it, it really took a step forward and you know it's all great when you get to the World Cup and things like that but I, I do think that you should put importance on on a human life especially in these very dystopian and very unadventuristic times uh, I think it's also a great thing to show that uh, the the uh, trademark and I guess the stereotype that Serbian footballs are all you know, stupid and they're assholes and they don't really care about people around them and that they're just interested in themselves. Couldn't be further from the truth because a lot of the stories I've heard when you talk to those guys are they're very upstanding guys that, that act well, that behave well, they're there for a reason. And, uh, you know, they, they've done a great job, I think, this team of promoting unity. They've acted wonderfully well. We've heard no stories this year of um, issues that they've had in the camp or issues that they've had away from the pitch. It's a very healthy generation of players that seems to get along and promote Serbia in a good light. They've really taken steps forward to help people, uh, whether it's through various tweets or various actions that they've done. I think it's a lot of credit for it. I think it's been very frustrating at times, even though they have deserved it at times in the past. I do think that the criticism that they've gotten has been awfully harsh, or as basketball players and uh, water polo players and other people have gotten a pass for it. And I think it's it can be hypocritical at times. I'm glad that they're changing that stereotype, and I'm glad that they took a step forward to try and help somebody uh, football is a game at the end of the day, and if you can use that to help people, and that's always a great thing. It shows the power of football, and it uh, shows the importance of a human life, especially in these times. And uh, my only hope is that not only that that guy, but uh, also everyone of our listeners and everyone else stays healthy in the following game. That uh, if they had a great 2021, that they have a great 2022, and if they had a shitty 2021, that the next year is even better than the one after that. Uh, the same goes for you guys. Yeah, well, 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 well said, Alexa, man. And just, just real quick, news before you uh, wrap it up, man. If you ask Dusan Tadic what, what his biggest disappointment of the year is, you know what it would be? Mitro's <laughs> playing for Fulham. Yep, <laughs> Mitro's playing the championship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, damn right. We've already talked to Vander Sar about getting the transfer, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing link-up. <laughs> amen, amen. And uh, yeah, so I'll start my list with first, my most disappointing moment. And my most disappointing moment is Vucic on the plane before the team went to Portugal. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, Mr. President, don't suspend my account again, please. But, I mean, there was just no need for him to insert himself into that, you know, to offer the players a, a million euro reward if they won. Or, I mean, who cares? Like, those guys don't need that money. Um, Not to mention, he broke yeah. every COVID protocol under the sun. Oh, man, yeah. after social distancing. I mean, that was just that was just really a joke, and, and yeah. Yeah, we just need to keep keep that guy and politics in general as far away as possible from the national team. I, I, I think if he and did then, it without the million dollar prize or whatever, it would have been, gone over more smoothly. But the million dollar prize was almost insulting. I would say at least yeah, at least exactly. at least the players did the right thing with it, man. Yeah, exactly. And then for a disappointing mean, player. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I mean, you know, I just wanted to say that like, basketball players went ahead and they visited Milosevic in the past. And if you remember, like, the Romania game that we won 5 0, um, like, every second shot on the television screen was like of, of the former Democratic Party leader sitting in the VIP stand, you know, cheering on. So it's not something that's foreign, other, you know, top flight politicians have garnered with national teams but the way he did it just so right right but it, the whole financial uh, yeah. thing Obvi- obviously obviously like really it was like passes. a political move for him it looked good for him i would say at least and and like he's with the team or whatever and he's going to wish them good luck i think without the monetary thing i think that the the move would have gone over well as a as like a political move and you know serbia's behind yeah. you your president's behind you right but when you put the money in it then it's like all right man like what's going exactly. on exactly yeah if you were just there i mean whatever you know it'd still be kind of dumb but we wouldn't be a major issue but yeah the money thing is what makes it you know that much worse and, and a horrible moment in my opinion well, you don't then, suspend for, <laughs> yeah don't suspend this again please <laughs> uh, please sir do not <laughs> and then for the sporting player, I mean, I would have to say uh, Rakuch for me, Pelag Rakuch. Mm. Last year he had an amazing year for his club. Looked like he was, you know, getting ready to take kind of the next step in his career. And then I feel like this year he's kind of gone a little bit backwards. He hasn't been that great for the national team, in my opinion. He's got, he's looked a little unsure in quite a few of our games, unfortunately. And it seems like he's doing okay for his club still, but he's not playing at the level that he was, you know, last year or the season before. So um, I still think he's a quality goalkeeper. I still trust him as our number one. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot of questions to be asked about his play. And it looks like his spot might 
be one of the least secure ones, you know, going into the 2022 and the World Cup because we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, VMS is doing very well. Mike really is doing very well. You know, there's always Dimitrovic, who's an experienced goalkeeper. So I think he hasn't done himself many favors with some of his play and some of his mistakes. And, you know, he hasn't really taken that next step yet. He's still fairly young for a goalkeeper. Uh, I'm sure he will be fine and he will continue to develop. But uh, uh, just just for the last year, 2021, I, I don't think he's improved. And I think he's kind of, you know, won a little bit backwards, unfortunately. And then uh, for me, the best player uh, of the year, uh, I think for me that's an easy one. This man, he's the heart of our team, the heart of our nation. He's, you know, he, he beats, we, we beat when he beats, and that's Mitro. Alexander Mitrovic, I think, of course, we have players that are maybe better than him, better quality, more technically gifted and all that, but there's no one that fights like him. There's no one that gives every single ounce of their strength for the national team. He has bailed us out, saved us a million times, and he's going to do it a million more times. The man is an absolute legend. He's undeniably at the heart and soul of our team. Even if he's not starting, it doesn't matter. Even if he comes in the last 10 minutes for Vlachovic, perfect. He's the heart and soul of our team. Everybody loves him. He's such a great guy. Uh, just just someone that's so easy to cheer for. And it's amazing to see that he had his had his moments against Portugal. He had his revenge. You know, he put the demons in the, in the past uh, behind him and, you know, was able to give us that moment for himself and for the whole country and for every, for every Serbian fan. And, and that was amazing. And he deserved that more than anybody, in my opinion. And then for at the top moment of the year, um, obviously the goal aside, I would just say, as Alex has said as well, you know, the resurgence, resurgence of the national team, uh, I think it's been long overdue. We've all been waiting for this. We all wanted uh, our team to play this well for a really long time. And we finally got it. Uh, I mean, we're playing beautiful football. We're getting results. There's no drama. The team has good chemistry. The team has a good good environment. So, I mean, there's really nothing negative to say at all. And that's something we've been waiting for for a very, very long time. We finally have it. Um, but, yeah, in general, it's been an amazing year. And, uh, you know, before we cap off the show, I just want to thank our, my great co-host here, Luca. Uh, you're the man. Thanks for appreciate thanks you, for man. Always, uh, always coming through for the podcast and being such a good dude. Always appreciate you. Aksa as well. Always love your knowledge and your insight and all the help you provide uh, appreciate you as well my man and our, our boy valley so sad he can't be here he's probably in his you know third bottle of whiskey by now but uh, <laughs> but we love him all the more for it yeah exactly absolute legend one of the, one of the true ogs one of the greatest uh, national team fans you know in the history of our national team i would and say one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet yeah exactly one of the nicest men in the world heart of gold a true a true legend a true serb and you know it's only fitting that our final show of the year ends with a shout out, not by Valley, but for Valley and to to Valley. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think that's only fair. Um, Matata. <laughs> that's right, and you know, and of course, we want to thank our listeners for for another great year of the podcast. Uh, I promise, in twenty twenty two, we'll be more regular. Uh, we won't miss a game. We won't miss uh, you know post game, pre game, or anything like that. And we'll try to uh, be more uh, more engaging as well. And, and I think. Uh, our goal for 2022 is just to grow the podcast even more, uh, make a w- wider audience, better content, better quality. And we really appreciate the support and, and all your comments and everybody that's listening. And, uh, you know, we really wouldn't be doing the show without without you guys. Of course, this is a passion project. and We, we only do it because we care about Serbian football, but also it's great that we have some support and that we're able to provide, you know, people with similar interests as us with, with uh, you know, a shared passion and shared conversation about something that we all love. And uh, again, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to us and for, for following us on Twitter as well. Um, thank you for a great year. Serving football is uh, growing and, and growing at a better rate than ever. And hopefully we're able to grow with it as well. Thanks so much. Have a great year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy